Uh, welcome. Um, two things. Oh, three things. Cell phones. Turn them off, please. Second, there are more feedback forms um, on the membership table if you want to pick one up on your way out. The um, program committee really, really values your input. And speaking of the program committee, we know that um, our the head of the committee, Beth, is not with us right for this semester. She'll be back next semester, but she is very much with us in as far as planning for the next semester and being involved in everything that's going on. So she's still with us. Um, at the end of November, the week after Thanksgiving, is our lunch. And we have a wonderful, wonderful lunch. There is a cost, it's $15, and um, it's gonna be, happen right in here. We set up tables, and it starts at 12.30. In the back of the room is a sign-up sheet. You can sign up and bring your money next week. Um, and after the luncheon, it will be at two o'clock, our regular lecture. So now, where is our Yes, here she is, going to introduce our speaker. My name is Sandy, as many of you know. As many of you know, my name is Sandy, and I'm here, and I'm happy to introduce Professor John Waldron from the Department of Romance Languages at UVM. Uh, Professor Waldron graduated from universities in California. He has his PhD from the University of California at Irvine, correct? and his undergraduate degrees and master's degree degrees from the University of California at Santa Barbara. He is the author of many books and articles. He has recently done a book on globalism, globalization, edited a volume, Globalization in Mexico. And he is also a teacher of film studies. And this spring, we hope he will be teaching a film class in Havana, Cuba at the University of Havana. So if anybody's interested in that, uh, please sign up and come with us and under the continuing ed program. Here's Professor Waldron, though, to speak about the other wing of the bird, Puerto Rico. The two wings are Puerto Rico and Cuba. Well, uh, hello. Um, I'm not used to using one of these, and I'm also not used to lecturing. Um, usually, my when I talk to my students, it's a lot more interactive. Um, so if you feel you know, uh, like asking me a question or something, um, feel free, free to, you know, jump in. Um, <clears throat> so uh, thanks for that introduction. That was fantastic. And thanks for this inv invitation. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to people outside the UVM bubble. Um, maybe it'll, <laughs> you know, s make a difference. And it's also a beautiful fall day. I love the, the leaves, the late fall we're having. So um, when I talked to Sandy about this, uh, I think she, I don't remember exactly what she wanted, um, but it was something about um, Port something about Puerto Rico. She said, and because Maria had just happened, and I'm teaching a course kind of on this topic, I thought, well, let me talk about um, Puerto Rico, Ma Maria, Maria, and a thing called coloniality. Like um, coloniality um, is not exactly colonialism um, for many people. Um, for most of us, colonialism is over. Um, it was over a long time ago, uh, but Puerto Rico, as some of you may know, is considered the, the oldest colony in the world from the time of Colum Columbus's arrival in 1493 until many people would consider legally it still is a colony today. But coloniality is the continuation of colonialist practices in the present day. So it's the continuation of the imposition of capitalist structures, the imposition of of racist, um, gender, uh, gender biased, um, and so in, in, a sh in short, heteronormative practices um, throughout the world. And so the subtitle is The Shock Doctrine and the Oldest Colony in the World. Um, some of you may be familiar with Naomi Klein's work on the environment and shock doctrine. Um, she came to Puerto Rico um, shortly after Maria and gave several talks, um, did a lot of work there. She has a great book if you're interested in more about Puerto Rico and the Shock Doctrine called the Battle for Paradise. Um, the Shock Doctrine is, is essentially um, what we see happening in Puerto Rico, which is after a collapse, after um, an event that causes an extreme disruption in society, um, neoliberal uh, 
governments and other entities move in and try to impose neoliberal reforms. And that's precisely what's happening in Puerto Rico today. The governor took it, um, who's a Republican governor, took, uh, took the, the tragedy of Maria as the time to begin to try to privatize everything from education to the electric system to the telephone system, um, public works, uh, et cetera. So this is what the shock doctrine is. <clears throat> and anyway, so uh, let me get started here. Um, as some of you may know, uh, Puerto Rico um, was inhabited by a group of indigenous peoples before the arrival of Columbus. This group of indigenous peoples in inhabited most of the uh, islands of the Greater Antilles and some of the Lesser Antilles, and these people were called Tainos. If you go to Puerto Rico, you can still see places like this. This is a, considered a ceremonial ground, uh, Bate. And on these rocks, uh, a lot of times you'll see carved um, images um, from, I guess, the, the, the gods and the Spanish keeps coming out, sorry. The <laughs> gods and other entities uh, of, their, of their religion. Not, but not much is known about them because for the most part they were, um, they and their culture were eradicated um, because of disease, overwork, um, et cetera, that happened uh, as a result of the uh, invasion of uh, the Spaniards into, in Puerto Rico. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that, but, but recently they've done a lot of genetic studies on people who are of Puerto Rican descent, and they found that I think something like 60% of all Puerto Ricans have some gen genetic linkage to uh, the Taino Indians. So they're, you know, the argument is, oh no, they're still here, so, you know. <laughs> How, whatever you want to do with that. Um, so. so here's where Puerto Rico is located <coughs> in terms of, you know, geographically. Um, and so one of the reasons, I mean, Puerto Rico is kind of an interesting thing, be, uh, interesting in a lot of different ways, but one of the things is, is that, you know, it's a small and kind of forgotten island, and yet it ends up being super important. There's some reason why the Spaniards wanted to conquer it and wanted to keep it, even though it didn't have vast reserves of gold or other types of things that they could extract for easy wealth. Um, the same thing, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, prior to 1898, when the United States invaded Puerto Rico during the Spanish-American War, um, Theodore Roosevelt said, the United States must have Puerto Rico. We have to have it. And one of the reasons for this is that Puerto Rico occupies a strategically important point in the Caribbean. Theodore Roosevelt had as his you know, theater, what, I'm sorry about the sound. It was Theodore Roosevelt wanted to, you know, they were constructing the Panama Canal at that time, and P Puerto Rico was seen as the gateway to the Caribbean for that. And also, you know, the, and for the same reasons the Spaniards wanted it. I mean, it's a very small island, so you can't really grow tons of sugar or coffee on it. Um, it didn't have a lot of gold, but strategically, it's always been seen as um, of military importance. And so if you go to Puerto Rico, if you haven't already been there, yeah, I'm sure you will take a visit of this incredible place, which has actually been renovated um, recently in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, when I first went there, longer ago than I care to admit, it, it, was not, it, was not, it was cool, but it wasn't as great as it is now. It's a really incredible uh, historical site to see. But this is called El Morro, and this sits out um, on the point that guards um, the entrance to, this is the bay, the entrance to the bay over here. But that's sort of, I put that there as sort of a symbol, right, of, of Puerto Rico is, is usually seen as a military base by the people who own it and want it, and for no other reasons. So what happened, so, so the Spaniards, in, you know, they colonized Latin America, um, they controlled most of Latin America, except for Brazil and Haiti and other places. And then in the early part of the 1800s, there were independence movements throughout Latin America um, th for a lot of different reasons. Spain began to lose power, the Napoleonic invasions in Spain, et cetera. And, uh, and so the, the Spanish Empire begins to lose power, and the Criollos, the, the wealthy ruling class in Latin America, say, well, why are we paying money to this crown that doesn't really have any power, and they took over. That's kind of a very simplistic version of what happened. Um, so the result, the result of this, and also, the, and, and also this is, you know, after the Haitian Revolution, which was also very important, the result of this is twofold in, in Puerto Rico. 
one thing that happens is that the more conservative people in Latin America who did not want to become free from the Spanish crown migrated to Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico and Cuba were the only two colonies in Latin America that did not become independent. The result of the Haitian Revolution, which happened earlier, was that there was a decline in sugar production. So, um, you know, Haiti was, for a lot of different reasons, the most productive um, colony in the world for sugar, in part because the French were such brutal colonists, they went through, they worked their slaves literally to death. Um, and they also had, you know, uh, vast extensions of land um, um, that they used for uh, sugarcane production. And so after, <coughs> after the Haitian Revolution and after the revolutions of Latin America, you have an influx of, of more conservative typed people and also an increase in sugar production. So you have an increase in sugar production and also an increase in coffee production. So what, what happens as a result of this is Puerto Rico becomes more wealthy but at the same time, it's, it's no longer just a military base. It's now the lands of Puerto Rico, which you know, some historians say people, Puerto Rico was sort of self-sufficient in terms of agriculture. It now becomes a monoculture or a bicultural um, entity. And their, their economy becomes more and more dependent on export. So they become kind of dependent on this sort of colonial capitalist relation with Europe, right? Being able to export sugar, export coffee. And so they then need to import slaves, where before Puerto Rico did not have that many slaves, the, they increase um, substantially the number of slaves. So, oh, why do I keep having trouble with that? Oh. So what happens in around the, the, during the middle to late part of the 1800s is we have independence movements. One of the independence movements is led by this guy, who I'm sure most people may know already, um, Jose Marti, who uh, was exiled from Cuba, was a Cuban independence leader. And he met up, actually, with these other two guys over here. This is uh, Meterio Betances, Ramon Meterio Betances, and Eugenio Maria de Hostos, both independence leaders in um, Puerto Rico. And they um, devised a plan to, um, what they wanted to do was to unite the Caribbean, or at least unite the Spanish-speaking Caribbean under the same flag. So they devised a thing called, they were going to have their own screams or, or gritos, right? El grito de Lares and el grito de Yares, Yares in, in, in Cuba. The Cuban one was a little bit more, respect, uh, a little bit more um, successful. I think it lasted, it, 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 it resulted in what, what's called the Ten Years' War. The one in Puerto Rico lasted only a few months. And, in part, and part of that is in part because of the, you know, the more conservative people who came to Puerto Rico didn't want Puerto Rico to be independent, and so they were, they were um, outed. They were you know, by spies. Here we have, this is the, the flag from El Grito de Lares, and it's also a flag that a lot of the people in favor of independence um, today will, will use. So this is, so in 1898, I guess I didn't do this exactly right. In 1898, um, the United States um, invades um, Puerto Rico and Cuba, and here we have a picture of that invasion. The uh, invasion was not met with a lot of resistance um, in Puerto Rico, whoops, wrong picture, was not, was not met with a lot of resistance in Puerto Rico, uh, in part because Puerto Rico, a lot of people in Puerto Rico at the time had looked to what had happened when the United States had invaded other lands and territories. For example, just recently, uh, historically, just maybe 50 years before, they had invaded huge extensions of Mexico, what was then Mexico, that resulted in the 1848 um, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which gave the United States um, what is now Texas, California, Nevada, color, all those western states with sort of Spanish sounding names. Um, that, that was all part of Mexico. And after the invasion of 1848, those all became, well, <laughs> after you know, many years, of course, they all became states. So Puerto Rico thought, well, you know, it won't be so bad. You know, we'll, have a dem we'll become a democracy. You know, it'll be all right. Um, this didn't happen, and I'll, t 
talk about more, I'll talk <coughs> about that a little bit later for about reasons why. But here is kind of an interesting thing. So th there was actually, you know, they say that Puerto Rico is the longest, oldest colony in the world, but there was actually, you know, a couple weeks when it wasn't, right? There was a week or two in between the invasion of the United States and the Treaty of Paris that gave Puerto Rico to the United States as war prize when it was not, um, it was not a colony. It was actually, in terms of ostos, free. So here is my really awful translation <coughs> of what Osto says in his diary um, during those weeks. He says, I missed the fervent ple placer, <laughs> good job. Um, <laughs> I, missed, I missed the fervent pleasure with which I breathed what I called the breeze of the nation, which seemed the purest to me, the most regenerative of all the possible breezes. I miss the effective force that I loved from my land. In reality, I miss the patria. I was disgraced. At the same time, after years of efforts, when I thought I would see the force of native society, native society raise them, I saw them faint and fall by the same force I had believed in. So he here is talking about that, you know, <clears throat> and here we see this, you know, the transition. Here he's feeling free you know, this incredible regenerative breeze. <clears throat> my, I loved my land, I missed my homeland, but then I was disgraced. Instead of my people raising up and fighting um, the way that I thought they would, um, they were fallen by, by the same force I had believed in, which I'm not sure exactly what that means, um, but, but they fall, and he's really upset. So there's a period of time, oh, that slide's coming. That's how it's out of place, too. There's a, peri there's a period of time that, <coughs> that happens between 1898 and 1917 when Puerto Ricans essentially have no recognized identity. So there, were, there are stories of people, of an artist, for example, who's in Paris, and he can't travel. He can't leave France because he doesn't have an officially recognized passport. Nobody knows who he is. I mean, <laughs> officially has no status. There are other stories like that, like people who are living in New York at the time and they can't leave the United States because they don't have papers that let them leave. So this became a problem for the US. They didn't know what to do with these people. Um, all of a sudden they have you know, this <laughs> whole island of people um, and they don't, they, they're trying to figure out what to, what to do. So this resulted in a really, really weird thing and I have Tim Murad to thank, thank for this because many years ago he directed me toward a book called Foreign in a Domestic Sense, um, which is, uh, it resulted in this, in this series of things, of court cases called the insular cases. So these cases were used to determine what the status of Puerto Rico would be. Like would, would they become citizens? Would they not become citizens? Would Puerto Rico become a state? Would it remain independent? And the problem was because people I think constitutionally we can't have a colony. It's illegal for us to have a colony, or at least people thought so. So this resulted in a decision that's really weird <coughs> and resulted in kind of the weird political stat status that Puerto Rico occupies until today called foreign in a domestic sense. If anybody can figure out what that means exactly, please let me know. I'd love to hear it. <coughs> um, but. But essentially what happened was that Puerto, Rico, Puerto Ricans were given uh, US citizenship, and this happened in 1917 with a thing called the Jones Law, but they were not considered, the, the Puerto Rico itself is not considered part of the United States. So it's part of the United States in some respects, but not part of it in others. One of the reasons why they were given citizenship precisely during that year was because the United States needed people to go to war. Right? They're involved in World War I, and they needed people to conscript. So the, the deal was, okay, we'll give you US citizenship, you'll be able to travel, but you have to send your men to the war. So that's, that's kind of what happened. So one of the questions that comes up a lot is, well, why? Like, why was it that, that before, you know, for Puerto Ricans and everybody else, it's like, well, why was it that before you were, you know, you invaded these other lands, but you, and you let them become states, and why not us? What's the deal? Why are we so special? 
Um, and part of the thing that happened, it has to do with some really complex stuff that's happening in the United States at the time. Um, and it's kind of led by this guy, Henry Cabot Lodge, who you, the name may ring a bell. Um, and he, he and others, I mean, it, it seems kind of hard to believe, but maybe not, that, that, the, that the Civil War was still on everybody's mind. And so they were trying to figure out ways to bring the country together, ways to unite the country. And one of the ways they came up with was with this sort of myth that they created called uh, the two, uh, Teutonic consult con Constitutionalism, which was this idea that people, and that's why I have a picture of the, of the German forests here, um, that people who emerged from the German forests were genetically predisposed to democracy. I'll send you the article, it's there. I mean, it's, it's written down, he argues this legally. And he got other people to believe him. Henry Adams was actually the first proponent of this idea. So it was an idea that, that like, okay, so we can, we, you know, people who come out of the, emerge from these forests, we are capable of democracy, but these other people aren't, right? And so that's what's that different, that's what separates us from them. So Cabot Lodge's argument for keeping Puerto Rico out of the United States was we can't have all these, these people who aren't from Teutonic forests coming into our country because they don't know what democracy is. They, they will not be able to participate in a democracy, right? Are there any questions? <laughs> it's weird, it's weird. And my students, I mean, I taught about this in my class and they're just like, this is science fiction, right? And I'm like, no, look, it's there. And, and one of the reasons I teach this is because I'm not a history teacher, I'm a literature teacher. And one of the reasons I teach this is to show the importance of literature and show the importance of cultural images that we use, right? So they created, they used this myth, right? A fantasy, a story. And this fantasy or story became law. And it shaped law. And it shaped the ways that laws were written. It also resulted in a couple of severe things. So in Puerto Rico in 1938, Puerto Ricans are like, I don't like this. A lot of them were, I, this is not good. I don't, I don't, I want to be independent. And so there was a group of nationalists, uh, people who were in favor of the independence of the country, who were in favor of nationalism. And they had a march in Ponce, in south of Puerto Rico, on the day of, uh, Como se dice Domingo de Domingo Ramos is um, Palm Sunday. So, and they're just walking. I mean, they, some of them I think may have had wooden guns. I don't know. They're walking, and at the time, the you at, during that time the U.S. decided who would be the rule, the governor of the island. During that time, this guy Blanton Winship, who's got you know, if you read his history, he's really well known for you know having a very hard hand and putting down any kind of opposition. He called in the military and the police and told them to open fire. So this resulted in a thing called the Massacre de Ponce, the massacre in Ponce, which is a really important moment in, in uh, Puerto Rican history. But it is also a moment, curiously enough, that if you talk to a lot of Puerto Ricans of, the gener of certain generations, many of them don't know about it because it wasn't something normally taught in school. And it isn't taught in our schools, of course. But, and here, interesting, talk about the way news, you know, we're all worried about fake news these days and how, you know, news is kind of manipulated. Here is the, the man himself, Blanton Winship, who goes to Ponce, because the, the story that they developed was, oh, there were snipers up on the balcony, and they were shooting at us. And that's why we, sh we started fire. So here he is looking up at the balcony from which they fired, which and, you know, was a total fabrication. That did not happen. But here we see you know, the dead, you know, the bloodied police officer who was killed. No, it wasn't a police officer. That's a protester. There were no police officers killed. So there we have it, fake news. So, so in, in this you know, environment emerges this person. Uh, Don Pedro, Pedro Albizu Campos, who's in favor of nationalism. He's in favor of Puerto Rico becoming independent. And he becomes a very sort of 
stern and even sometimes violent voice in favor of Puerto Rican independence. He has a connection to Vermont. He went to the University of Vermont for, for a semester um, and, then, and then went to Harvard after that and became a lawyer. So here's Don Pedro. And then we have the other person, the other pole is Luis Munoz Marin. So if you ever go to Puerto Rico, you'll probably fly into the Luis Munoz Marin Airport. Um, the airport's named after him. He was in favor of, uh, he was in favor of sort of the status quo of Puerto Rico. His, his philosophy um, was one that Puerto Rico is not yet economically ready to be independent. Um, we aren't, you know, because, and, and also, I mean, Puerto Rico had a lot of economic problems. They, um, illiteracy rate was very high, et cetera, because of all their years of coloniality under Spain. So he's like, well, Puerto Rico, we're not ready yet, so we need to develop ourselves economically and socially, culturally, before we can be independent. So those are the two people who, who sort of duked it out. So in 1948, they have a very key election. The election will be to decide who is going to be the first elected governor of Puerto Rico, who ends up being Luis Munoz Marin, and whether what Puerto Rico's status should, de should be. So Puerto Ricans were actually going to vote, and they, they do sometimes from time to time, in a thing called a plebiscite, to decide should they be, be independent, or should, they re should the status quo of, um, I think it's now officially called Estado Libre Asociado, a free associated state, um, should they do that? <coughs> So that's great, right? They're gonna have a dem democratic re uh, election. It's fantastic. Um, that's good. We like democracy. Um, but what was happening at the time was also McCarthyism starting to rise. Um, Pedro Albizu Campos, um, along with his nationalism, is in contact with quote unquote, revo quote unquote revolutionaries throughout Latin America. Um, the US sees him as a threat because they think he's communist. Um, and so they want to put it, you know, they don't want him to win, obviously. So they institute a law called La Ley Mordaza, a gag law. This law makes it illegal to speak in favor of independence. It makes it illegal to speak against the United States. It makes it illegal to speak in, against for the free associated state. It makes it illegal to have a Puerto Rican flag. A man was actually arrested for having a Puerto Rican flag inside his house. Um, a poet who I actually had the opportunity to meet, um, uh, Francisco Matos Paoli, was imprisoned in this place, ironically called La Princesa, or the Princess. And he um, wrote poetry on the walls of his prison cell which were later whitewashed over by the guards. And then he wrote the paper, he wrote them on like rice paper that was secreted into him and they folded it up in rice and coffee bags out to his wife who then ironed the poems and later published them. Um, I actually got to see those, that was really fantastic. Um, and he eventually kind of slowly became, you know, um, mentally unstable and remained so for the rest of his life. Um, the other thing that happened was that because, of course, he was in prison because he gave a, a, a speech in favor of independence. The other thing that happened, of course, is that Pedro Alviso Campos, of course, he's imprisoned for many, many years and subjected in, in, the prison in, in a prison in Georgia to radiological experiments. So we see the effects of those experiments here on his body. So he died shortly after being released from prison. So here are some key, I guess, uh, historical moments. The 1917 Jones Law, the 1938 Massacre de Ponce, 1948 Le Mordaza, Luis Munoz Marin is elected the first Puerto Rican government by the Puerto Rican people, and in 1950, Operation Bootstrap. Before I talk about Operation Bootstrap, I'd like to, talk, like to talk about another thing that happened with, not the 17 Jones Law, but a one I think was in 1924, also called the Jones Law, excuse, excuse me, that um, affected what happened in Maria. And that is that, 
and also has a, an incredible economic effect on the people of Puerto Rico, and that is that anything that is imported into Puerto Rico has to come to Puerto Rico on a US flagged ship. So that means it has to pass through a port, usually passes through a port in Savannah. And so everything has to be offloaded and then unloaded. This drives up, you can imagine, the price of anything that's coming to Puerto Rico is driven up incredibly. It also, after Maria, had an incredible effect because other countries wanted to send aid to Puerto Rico, but were unable to because the, the things they wanted to send had to be loaded onto American flagged ships. Trump suspended that law, I think, for maybe three weeks, and then because of the shipping lobby, he got so upset, he, he let it go back. Um, so that's what, okay, oh, okay, now, Operation Bootstrap. Operation Bootstrap's really important, it happens in the 1950s. 50s is a real pivot, pivotal year. So the, th the thing with Operation Bootstrap is it begins a thing called um, developmentalism or desarrollismo. And it is, in order to solve the grinding, so Puerto Rico uh, suffered the, gr uh, the same effects of the Great Depression as anybody else suffered, but worse. And they didn't end. It was still going on in the 1950s. So they institute, Munoz Marin institutes a thing called Operation Bootstrap with the United States. Teodoro Moscoso, if you go across this bridge, after leaving the airport that has Puerto Rican flags on either side. I think that's the, the Puente Moscoso, named after him. Uh, and Operation Bootstrap brought factories to, the United, to Puerto Rico. It brought industry, it brought technology, it made it easier for, for um, uh, como se dice fabricas? Um, factories <laughs> to, do, to, to do work because they, you know, they had tax breaks and things like this. And it, it completely, in, in many ways, it completely transforms the landscape of Puerto Rico because now the poor, uh, Puerto Rican laborer, um, rather than working his plot of land or her plot of land, is now encouraged to go to the city and work in the, the, the factories. Um, Rene Marquez has an incredible play called La Carreta, which details this, this movement of the, the Puerto Rican people into the city. It didn't really do a whole lot. I mean, there are a lot of studies about it, and it, it, it essentially, what the effect was, was to move people from the country to the city um, in terms of, but the people weren't really paid a livable wage. Uh, light, working circumstances were very difficult. Um, so it didn't do a whole lot as far as helping the, envi uh, the economic environment, but it did do some things. This model, op and, and this is another thing that, that happens, like if you study Puerto Rican culture a lot, the model of Operation Bootstrap is then employed by the United States and other, and, and not the United States, but companies throughout Latin America and throughout um, the global south. Um, and we see one of the, the effects in Mexico with the maquiadoras. The maquiadoras is an idea that, that sprang from Operation Bootstrap. And this is something that, that happens in Puerto Rican. Puerto Rico is, is many times <laughs> seen as sort of this experiment, uh, a laboratory for things that the United States and, and companies want to see if they'll work there and then they, they go and use them elsewhere. So another really important thing is the island of, Vie of Vieques. So this is kind of very symbolic in, in many ways. So you have this incredible island, um, and you'll notice that this half has roads on it, but this half doesn't, and it's called restricted area. Anybody know why? The United States had all the military people over there. Right. What? Bombing range? Yeah, it was a bombing range. It was used. The U.S. used it for to practice um, to practice air uh, air land air land and sea assaults. Yep. So that happened. That it was that way for many years, until until uh, two th uh, 19, the, the early two thousands when people protested and got rid of the 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 marina, got rid of the navy. So here are some other really important um, historical events. Uh, the mass sterilization of women to reduce population and therefore economic problems in the 1970s. Um, El, El Caso Cerro Maravilla in 1978, there was a thing called um, the, the, the Cerro Maravilla case 
where these two young kids, um, both of them were actually sons of famous writers, were part of a group called the Macheteros. And they were convinced by a spy, or a, like a double agent, that they needed to go up to this mountain called Maravilla and bomb a, 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 a communications tower, that this would be a revolutionary act, and they really needed to do that. And they went up there and did it, and the police, of course, were waiting for them, right? Because they were, you know, the police were <laughs> kind of involved in it even happening to begin with. Um, and they killed them, they killed the two kids. Um, and this was called a, uh, let me see, I have that slide somewhere, where is that? Things are kind of out of order here. Th this was called a terrorist act. And it happened again during a time when um, the governor at the time, Barcelo, who was in favor of statehood, was kind of losing in popularity. So there was some, most people to this day believe that he had a hand in orchestrating it because it gave him, it kind of created this panic in the people that, oh no, we can't go for independence or we can't, you know, we need to go, go for statehood because, you know, uh, Barcelona's in favor of statehood, so we have to vote for him because of these terrorists that want to destroy our country and we're afraid of them kind of, you know, the same kind of thing we see happening all the time. So in 1998, David Sáenz Rodríguez was killed by a quote-unquote fatal mistake in Vieques, and this resulted in a worldwide, actually, protest. People from all over the world came to Vieques to protest it, resulting in the, the Navy um, leaving. And in 2005, these are just some, you know, Highlight. So this is um, in 2005, Filiberto Ojeda Rios, who was a leader of the Macheteros, um, was, was assassinated in Lares, Puerto Rico, near Lares, Puerto Rico, on precisely the anniversary of El Grito de Lares by the FBI. Um, he was, um, and admittedly, he was a criminal. Um, he was a fugitive from justice. He was given a, 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 an ankle bracelet that he cut off and he had been on the run for many years, and they found him in his home. <laughs> they surrounded his home and waited for him to come outside and killed him. The person in charge of that operation was Robert Mueller. So here, I don't really, I'm not an econo economist, but I, I know people who are, <laughs> and they try to explain to me exactly what happened, um, but essentially, in the years, um, in the, especially in the later, later 90s and the 2000s, um, Puerto Rican economy started to tank precipitously, as we can see from these graphs. Um, part of the problem was is that they weren't bringing in enough money um, to pay off bondholders, so their bonds were, were reduced to junk status. And then there was something with, a, with one of these... Um, yeah, so, and that, and that kind of resulted in, and so they, had, they can't pay off their debt, they, and they have all these people who are retiring, they have pensions they have to pay, they're not bringing enough money, and the bonds aren't bringing them any money either. So they're incredibly uh, awful economic status. So that was going on right before Maria struck. So there's Maria flying over um, Puerto Rico. <coughs> and then of course, I'm sure you all know this picture. And then here are some pictures that I took um, in January after Maria, so a year ago, January. Um, this was many months after Maria, this, so Maria hit in September, uh, October, November, December, January, so four or five months later. This is a major intersection. The uh, lights aren't working. There's nobody out there directing traffic. Um, this is uh, a shot from my in-law's house looking out. So San Juan, the city of San Juan, has power, but you can see how dark it is. We only have light here because he had a generator. They were without power until May. They were, I was just telling some people in the back, they were without um, internet service, which, you know, like, I, don't, I guess it sounds like, I mean, I think of that as kind of a luxury, but I, it's so we need it so badly now. They were without internet service until August. Electricity and water is still very intermittent. As a result, one of the things that he and other people did was they started putting um, solar panels up. But one of the things that's happening because the governor wants to privatize the electric company, 
and he wants to make the electric company look like it has value so somebody will buy it, um, they actually charge them for producing solar power. So like if they're not, like, like in California, it used to be that, I don't know if it's still that way, but when, a long time ago when I lived there, if you produ produced, produced enough solar power and you kind of fed it back out on the grid, it would make your elect electric bill go down. In this case, it's like if your bill goes too far below what you normally pay, they charge you. So it's really not very great. Um, these are some more pictures. This is, um, this is Luisa. So this is probably a place where not many people go. This is um, a, 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 a community that's historically a community of run, runaway slaves that is now a um, very Afro-Puerto Rican community. Um, but you can see these are <laughs> cement electric poles that were fall, fell, fallen like uh, toothpicks. Here is, this was in July of this year. This is um, heading out to Luquillo Beach, which is out by El Yunque, the rainforest. Um, impassable roads still. So in this, in this environment, right, so it was already economically, Puerto Rico was already in, in really tough shape. Um, and then things got really worse, well, much worse after the hurricane. And in this environment, what's happening, on one side you have a bunch of people like the governor and a lot of others who are very in, in favor of privatization, right? And Obama put in, during the economic crisis, that was before the, the hurricane, a thing with the ironic name in Spanish called promesa, which means promise. Um, which was basically, uh, they, they, I think there might be one Puerto Rican on the board, but they're, they're deciding you know, how to make Puerto Rico more economically viable. And so this results in a lot of you know, extreme cuts, like they're cutting public, public education, um, they're reducing um, the payments to police and things like that, you know, any kind of public service that they can to save money. So this got even worse after the hurricane. But I also kind of wanted to end on a note of hope. Um, there are a lot of great responses to what's happened. One of them is this fantastic place, which was an amazing place even before the hurricane, called Casa Pueblo in Adjuntas, Puerto Rico. They make some of the best coffee in the island. Um, and this guy, Arturo Masol, um, what they did even before the hurricane is they had this idea of self-sustainability. So they, the, they you know, have read their history books and read at least what to many today may seem a myth that Puerto Rico can be self-sustainable. And they thought, well, let's see if it's true. So they started growing their own food. And they put solar panels on their roofs and started producing their own electricity. And they, they put cisterns. Many people in Puerto Rico already have cisterns, but they put cisterns up to collect rainwater and just regular water. And so they've become it's kind of more or less self-sustainable. Naomi, Naomi Klein calls these things happening in Puerto Rico, and he's not the only one. He, they call them, she calls them isle, islands of sovereignty. So like these little groups, these sort of micro units of people and groups sort of become self-sustainable. And they start interacting with each other. Like Masol has you know, some products that say, another group doesn't have, so they sort of trade products, right? So one of the great things that happened, not great things, but one of the interesting things that happened after, after, uh, after the hurricane was of course the, it wasn't interesting, but awful, that they lost electricity. But one of the things that happened in Adjuntas is the people came to Casa Pueblo. It's like if people with, with you know, medical machinery that they needed to use um, for whatever reason, um, whether resp ventilators or I don't know what else, they came to Casa Pueblo and could plug them in and use them. Whereas if they lived in other parts of the island, if they were without solar energy, a lot of people died because of that, because hospitals didn't have power, they couldn't get to hospitals, um, and this is why the death toll is so high from Puerto Rico. It wasn't you know, the, what happened immediately after, but it was the result of the loss of all these facilities. They also have a solar cinema, so people come in and watch movies, right? Um, they give them coffee, they give them water, and things like this. And so it kind of creates this really lovely kind of 
community of hope, I would say, that people, you know, if they can come together and work um, together the way that Muscle is doing, that, you know, there could be a positive thing that comes out of this. Um, Muscle, a couple, I think it was in September, was arrested by the police. Uh, he, he had picked his daughter up from, I think, I don't know, it was band practice or dance practice, something like that. And they had a pizza, a piece of pizza in the local pizza parlor. And he got in his truck and drove away and immediately was pulled over by the police. Um, and he said, he admitted, you know, it's an old truck. Everybody knows it's my truck. Everybody in the town knows me by my truck. And he had let the Marvete, the, the registration. And so he thought, oh, that's why they're pulling me over. The cop pulls him over and says, you're drunk. He did not, he had not had a beer. The guy in the, the pizza parlor testifies, he, no. He doesn't drink much at all, and he definitely didn't have anything that night. And my soul's like, I'm not drunk. I didn't, I'm not signing anything. And so he tried to give him a breathalyzer there, and it didn't function, the cop said. So they took him into the police station and gave him a test. And I think he res the test resulted in, uh, what's, le what's the legal limit? Like point. Yeah, I think it was 0 .50. .50. Yeah, exactly. He should be dead. Yeah. Resulted in .50. Um, and he said that this is just, some, just, just sort of the, the culmination of a, sort of an ongoing harassment that he's feeling from the local uh, authorities, from the, the, the governmental representations, the police. Um, and he doesn't know why that's happening. But that's what I want to end with. <laughs> which is hope. I mean, I think that um, there are many reasons to hope um, Puerto Rico could be a better place. I think maybe the destruction of Maria could, you know, create these, you know, networks, islands of sovereignty. There's another fantastic group called Junta Gente, if you're interested. Um, I can send you the website um, that are also creating these types of um, islands of sovereignty. So anyway, thank you very much for paying attention. Hello? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wondered what you know about U.S. faith-based organizations of various denominations who are trying to work in Puerto Rico and relative success or lack? I, I haven't heard of any. I, 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 I'm sure there are, but I, I mean, the, the, the groups that I've heard of are the ones that I've already mentioned. I, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are there. I just... There are so many that it's hard to keep track, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know about them. Sorry. Is there one that you know of, that I should know of? Let, uh, can you give her the microphone? She's gonna inform me. Well, just the only one I have personal knowledge of is the American Baptist Churches USA, okay. um, who operate in the United States and, and uh, Puerto Rico in terms of their own home missions, and they're sending quite a lot of relief and have been since the storm. That's fantastic. I, and I know that there are a lot of organizations right here in, in Burlington who are doing that also. That's, that's great. Thanks for telling me that. Great. What's the, uh, what's the status uh, of Puerto Ricans as to U.S. income tax? Do you mean, uh, what do you mean? Do you mean personal income tax or? I remember reading somewhere that uh, there was some controversy over whether uh, Puerto Ricans would be subject to U.S. income tax. And I don't know whether they are or aren't, but uh, there was some controversy about that. And I, I don't know what the outcome was. Well, um, from my understanding, they're not. I mean, on the island, they're not. But if you, if you take that in the context to the I mean, what happens as a result of, of the Jones Law, the things being, you know, having to, to, to come to Puerto Rico on U.S. flagged ships, I, and there are other ways that they, that, that also kind of 
you know, cuts into, you know, maybe they don't pay personal income tax, but that's one way that I think they are taxed. Yeah. Well, I believe that they don't pay personal income tax, and that's why they're not allowed to vote when they're on the island. Okay. And then as soon as they, you know, move somewhere else, then they are pay tax and are given the right to vote. But right. my question is, what exactly was the beef with, did you say his name was Masson? Who? The last gentleman that you showed on. Oh, the with Masson? Like, what's, his, what's the beef with him? Yeah, like, what did the government exactly have against him besides? I actually have two questions. You know, he doesn't even, he doesn't even know. I mean, he, I, I would, I mean, you know, read in the context, I mean, I don't want to get all conspiracy theory on people here, but, but I think that, you know, he's not doing, he's, he's having tremendous success doing what he does, which is not, which kind of goes against what the government wants to happen, which is instead of privatization, he's making people independent and self-sufficient. And so that's result, you know, that's kind of not what the government wants to happen. The government wants privatization. So is that the law then? Like, so if you have solar panels on your roof and you have a battery, you still have to pay the electric company? From what people are telling me, yeah, that's, that's what's happening. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, my question is, I'm right here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to ask if those sanctuaries that you had mentioned um, accept volunteers. Yes. Some of them are overrun. So you might want to, I mean, you could, if you went, there's, a, there's one called Junta Gente, so J-U-N-T-A-G-E-N-T-E. -E. Um, that's the one that everybody knows about. So everybody's going to them. Um, but if you got in touch with them, they might be able to tell you where else where you else could go. And also, I don't know what the, the lady's the name. I mean, that might be another great great way that I didn't know about that okay. that you could also um, work. And also, if you contacted Casa Pueblo, they might be able to. Ex they'd be maybe happy to accept your help, or you know, feed it into somebody else who who they know of who needs okay. the help. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in 1898, the world, the U.S. was also rescuing, quote, uh, the Philippines right. from revolution. Right. And part of the myth was we had to uh, educate and bring in these little brown people and give them democracy. Is oh. that the myth that was also propagated in Puerto Rico? You know, that's the that's the really that's the really kind of strange thing that I haven't completely unraveled yet because. The relation, why was it not okay with Puerto Rico, but, uh, you know, their attitude to the Hawaiian Islands was also different. Why did we make Hawaii a state? Um, and also our, our relationship with the Philippines, I think, is somewhat different. And I haven't fully unraveled those questions yet. So maybe it looks like somebody here has. So, Oh, okay. <laughs> what? I, yeah, well, that's the beauty of teaching is I always learn how much I don't know. So that's great. <laughs> So in 1898, when the Spanish-American War, it may not be on. Oh, okay. So in 1898, when the Spanish-American War happened, why was not Cuba considered the same way as Puerto Rico? How did Cuba end up on their own? Sandy. <laughs> Really want me to say? Yeah. I mean, mostly this is my opinion, but I think Cuba was in a very unusual status after the War of 1898 as well. They were a little more free than Puerto Rico, and they established a little bit more of a national uh, domestic system. However, they had to agree to certain restrictions in order to win that, and one of them was the Platt Amendment. And the Platt Amendment was uh, put on Cuba, which uh, meant that they could not determine, for instance, their own foreign policy they had to submit to the foreign policy of the United States, which is one of the reasons that they got in trouble when they made a quasi-alliance with the Soviet Union. Um, so, and they had to accept all those restrictions, and they had to accept, really, uh, the fact that their economy and the corporations of the United States basically took over the economy of Cuba. So Cuba was not really independent at all, although slight, it wasn't like Puerto Rico, it wasn't totally a colony but it wasn't free either. And it isn't really to the day, this day really because they suffer under the embargo of the United States. Um, 
at, at one point uh, uh, during that period when uh, Cuban or the Puerto Rican economy had growth in manufacturing, uh, drug manufacturers really were a significant part of that growth. It's and the home uh, of Viagra. I mean, it was, yeah, 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 yeah. And I, th my understanding is that growth has stopped and actually reduced the move to off island. Do you have any sense about what the circumstances or conditions are that that would happen? Yeah, um, there was. Uh, I think it was the law. I think it was the law 128, which gave um, corporations huge tax breaks to to exist in in Puerto Rico, and uh, that law was rescinded. And as a re and that was another way that 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 was another sort of hit to the to the Puerto Rican economy and to labor. In my estimation or recollection, the Puerto Ricans voted many times whether they wanted to become U.S. citizens or not. Oh, you mean a state? Uh, a state, state yeah. a state of yep. the U.S. Yep. And uh, what, are they still doing that? What was the reason one? I think okay, one of them was extremely close. Well, um, most of them have been very close. The, 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 the one, they just had one recently, but the one before that, um, there was a, a a thing on the ballot. There, so usually they have three options. They, the option is statehood, um, status quo, or independence. And on this particular ballot, there was also another option called none of the above. Uh. <clears throat> and and I believe none of the above won. <laughs> and in the last in the last election, in the last election, most people who were not in favor of statehood did not vote because they felt that it was a complete travesty, what the governor was trying to pull off. So statehood won. Mm -hmm. um, and people who are in favor of independence generally don't vote because they feel that you, because if going back to the, the gag law in 48, they feel that they are not in a, in a situation that is, allows for a free and independent vote. Mm -hmm. So they think it's a complete ruse and a sham, so they don't vote. So. It's hard to say. I mean, some people, <clears throat> there are some authors who write about this very complicated situation because during, um, during the whole thing that happened with Vieques, during the protests that happened in Vieques, there was a, a, the governor at the time was in favor of statehood. But he came out in favor of the protesters in Vieques, which, who were mostly, you know, was run and promoted by the independentistas, the people in favor of freedom. And so some poets started writing these li interesting lines about how if you scratch a Puerto Rican de deeply enough, you'll find in a, in a, an independentista. You'll find somebody in favor of independence, right? Um, so it's, it's hard to say. I mean, it's also kind of psychotic because even the people who, like Rosselló, who's in favor of independence, he'll say, oh, no, we can become a state, but we can still maintain our traditions. So we can still maintain our language. Um, you know, all of our cultural traditions that make us who we are, which I don't see that. I don't know how that would happen, but so it's kind of interesting. Thanks. What do you see as the future of Puerto Rico, considering how <laughs> unpopular self-determination is? Uh, I try to be hopeful. Um, I, I try to be hopeful about a lot of things these days, and I'm finding it more and more difficult. <laughs> um, I, I think ultimately, I, I think if if Trump, our, I mean our current administration, um, if if they were fully aware that Puerto Rico existed, I, I think you know that it's not just a place covered around, surrounded by big water. That that they that they would they would probably cut it loose. I I don't really see any reason. I don't see any reason for Puerto Rico to to be part of the United I, from the U.S. perspective. I don't see any reason for Puerto Rico to be part of the United States. And Patrick Buchanan, many years ago, who's very much uh, you know, to the right, has writ, writ, had wrote several essays saying that Puerto Rico should be independent. So I, I, that's, I mean, but I have no idea. I, I w you know, it's probably just gonna continue the way it is for you know, forever, I don't know. Given everything that's happened to Puerto Rico, both economically and by, other, by us and with the weather and whatnot. Do you think an independent Puerto Rico would be economically viable? Oh, see, that's always the problem, isn't it? I mean, 
I mean, that's, you know, uh, I mean, would it end up like, like Haiti? Would it end up like the Dominican Republic? Um, I, I don't know. Um, is it, but what are, I mean, also to be on the island now, to look at the way things are now, economically, it's not in very good shape. I mean, and culturally it's not, I mean, culturally it's fine, but I mean, in terms of economics, I mean, most of the, uh, uh, it used to be that 50% of the Puerto Ricans, 50% of Puerto Ricans lived on the island and 50% lived here. And that was another thing I didn't mention was that uh, another tactic used by politicians to sort of, in the 50s especially, but throughout time, and we see it happening again um, in, the t in the 2000s, to sort of ameliorate the, the difficulties that they're having is to use this thing called an escape valve, which is to encourage people to, to leave the island. And the example I always like to give is West Side Story. Right, because when Bernstein, when Bernstein and Sondheim originally imagined that play, that musical, which I love, um, they imagined it between Irish and Italians. And then Bernstein went and visited the, the neighborhood again that he wanted to write about, and, the, and it was Puerto Ricans. Why? Well, because they had left the island. They were, you know, it was cheap to come to the United States. The flights were very inexpensive. The boat rides were very inexpensive. Manufacturing, there were jobs were more plentiful, so people were encouraged, encouraged actually by Luis Munoz Marin to leave the island. Same thing was happening in the 2000s. People were leaving the island in droves to come to Orlando, right? And everybody's talking about how's how's this going to affect the elections, right? Um, and then after the after the hurricane, it was even worse. So. So if you take that into consideration, and then you drive around the island and you see the, how devastated it is and how nothing's happening. I mean, nothing, very little is happening to make things better. I mean, if you go to old San Juan or the tourist areas, things are starting to come back. I had actually almost cried when I was there in January because I walked through the streets of old San Juan and I had, it felt like I was in a ghost town. But things now are much better, but in the tourist areas. So. I don't, I mean, it's hard to say. Would Things are so bad now, I'm not sure if becoming independent would make things that much worse. I, I don't know. Oh, um, I was just wondering if you would recommend a book about the history of Puerto Rico. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, there's a really um, hair-raising book by... Um, called The War Against All Puerto Ricans, which will curl your hair um, if it isn't already. And um, that one is pretty good up until 1950. There's one, another one by um, Jose Trias Monge called Puerto Rico, the oldest colony in the world. And if you can't find those, you can any of you can email me and I'd be more than happy to, yeah. I've got something. Uh, it's positive. And us people in New England could be very proud of the fact that the, some of the best baseball players <laughs> in the world come from Puerto Rico. I think, I'm not sure if I fell in love with Puerto Rico because my wife's Puerto Rican or because my favorite baseball player growing up was Roberto Clemente. I'm not <laughs> really sure. But um, it, I have, a, I have a, actually another funny story about that. When, right after 9-11, my in-law's mother came to visit and we went to Montreal and we we're coming across and, and she didn't have a passport. All she had was a birth, uh, not a birth certificate either, and she had a, a baptismal certificate, which is something that counts down there. And uh, we're trying to get across the border when they had just changed the law that you need a passport. And she's from a little town called Cuamo. Now, Roberto Clemente is from Rio Piedras, which is not Cuamo. So we're coming across the border, and they, they gave us a hard time. And she's getting all upset because she's thinking, oh, my, you know, the first time she'd ever left the country in her life, you know, and, and you see she was shaken. And the guy comes back, and he said, well, my boss says that, that you can come in to the country as long as you tell me the most famous baseball player from your, from your town. Not from your country, your town. And so she's like, I don't even know. No baseball player ever came out of my town. And I, and I looked at her and I said, Roberto Clemente. And that's what she said. And we, got, we were able to come to the United States <laughs> because, of, because of that. Yeah. 
Thank you so very much.